thank you, Trevor, and uh, thank you all for joining us here today. We really appreciate you being here on behalf of all my colleagues at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, always pleased when folks are interested in our work and uh, willing to come out uh, on a beautiful day to listen to us talk about such nerdy policy issues like this. I promise to try to make it as exciting uh, and in interesting as possible, and that shouldn't be too hard because what I'm going to talk to you about today is this sort of grand tech policy clash of visions to come on a wide variety of fronts. Uh, as Trevor mentioned, uh, I'm writing about these issues um, in this new book of mine on permissionless innovation, the continuing case for comprehensive technological freedom, uh, in which I try to highlight sort of the, the policy clash of visions that's dividing folks as we talk about uh, the emerging disruptive technologies of our times and the policy issues and concerns surrounding them. So uh, just in general, the outline of the discussion for today I'm going to follow is I'm going to talk first about sort of the modern digital information age revolution and ask some questions about how that happened, what were the ingredients that fueled that uh, amazing success story. I'm going to then talk to you about some competing policy frameworks or paradigms about how people think about technological change, its impact on our life, our culture, our economy, and how it might shape public policy going forward. Then I'm going to tease out the, those two visions and how they play out in a variety of uh, case studies, uh, such as driverless cars, Internet of Things and wearable tech, private drones, and some other emerging tech issues. And then I'm going to conclude by talking about uh, some principles to foster continuing innovation in these and other areas. Again, it's all in my uh, new book. So let me start by asking this question, which is, when we think about the modern information age economy, we should ask ourselves, we should step back and not take it for granted, and ask, you know, where did all this modern innovation come from? When I was growing up uh, in the 60s and 70s, I lived in a world what you might think of as sort of information poverty, where we had very few choices. A couple of local television stations, a newspaper, a library or bookstore, not much else for those of us who grew up in rural communities. Flash forward just 25, 30 years and all of a sudden we have a cornucopia of choices at our disposal. Instead of living in a world of information poverty, we now live in a world of information overload. We, so much so that we complain about all the choices that we have to contend with on a daily basis pretty nice problem to have when you think about it. So let's ask ourselves, how did that happen? And how did this happen? How did so many innovative companies pop up so quickly? That's a little chart, maybe hard for you to see, of all the companies out there in Silicon Valley today, the big names at least. This is, just scratches the surface. You can't put them all on a chart. And of course, this is just the valley. This doesn't even count. All the innovation happening in all the other cities and states across the United States. But if you took that same snapshot just 25, 30 years ago, you'd only have a handful of household names on that chart, or how, how, a handful of names more generally. Let's also ask ourselves how this happened. This is a chart put together by Booz and Company, uh, noted consultants. Um, who every year do a survey of the most global innovative companies. Two 2013 results reveal that nine of the top ten most innovative companies in the world are based in the United States. Seven of the top ten are involved in computing, software, and digital technology. In fact, when I testified in the Senate recently about uh, some information technology policy issues, I asked the question that didn't uh, get me many friends in Europe when I asked, you know, can anybody in the, in the room, in the hearing room, name a leading tech innovator from Europe? It's really hard. And in fact, when you do name them, you say, well, Skype. Well, Skype was acquired by Microsoft. Um, and then after that, it's pretty hard. You know, Rovio, they make Angry Birds, you know, that's cool. Um, but really, the big names are all in the U.S. Even though a lot of people complain about innovation and competition in the U.S., we've got a lot of it when it comes to technology policy. And here is a snapshot. I'm sorry I wasn't able to yet reproduce the data on this. This is from Alberto Anetti, who put together a snapshot of global startup valuations in the United States versus Europe. And he just used the biggest names in the U.S. and some of the biggest names in terms of valuations and IPOs in Europe. And there are a couple, you know, Rovio, Skype, Wanga. Um, the valuations in the U.S., 1.7 trillion in the EU, 36 billion. That is a pretty remarkable, what economists would call natural real world experiment that's played out in terms of innovation policy uh, over the past 20, 30 years, whereas we've got it in spades and the Europeans are wondering how to get more of it. How did that happen? So there are a couple of different answers. One could be, well, it has something to do with access to capital. We've got a very he healthy VC market here, venture capital market. Of course, that has something to do with policy too. Um, we have maybe different clusters or educational centers where we 
try to foster certain types of innovation, uh, such as at Stanford and other universities that have helped uh, this sort of market flourish. You could say it has something to do with tax policy, although I'm not sure ours is that much better than the EU's. There must be something else. There has to be some other ingredient uh, or, or, or answer that unlocks this mystery of where all this innovation came from. I'm arguing that it comes down to two words, permissionless innovation. It comes down to a policy ethos that says the general freedom to experiment and learn through trial and error experimentation is what ultimately yields greatest, greater innovation, greater competition, greater choices, so on and so forth. And that because the US embraced that policy ethos, made it the basis of our digital economy policy thinking throughout the 1990s and beyond, that is really what has fueled the success of the modern information economy. Now let's recall that this wasn't always the case. In the early uh, uh, 70s and 80s as the internet was developing when it was called ARPANET, this was the policy. This is from a 1982 MIT handbook to students. Um, it said it is considered illegal to use the ARPANET, again the early internet, for anything which is not in direct support of government business. And that commercial, purpose, per commercial uses are both antisocial and illegal. And you can get in serious trouble with government agencies if you try to use the internet, the ARPANET, for other purposes other than those that were permissioned. Now, that all went away. It went away because in the 90s, thanks to some actions by the Clinton administration, uh, we decided to commercialize the internet, or at least open it to commercial options, and just contributions from all sorts of different players and individuals. And then everything took off. It just exploded, and the rest is history. We allowed anyone who wanted to get on the internet and basically create any sort of business, site, service, offer any sort of information they wanted. No one needed a license or permission to launch the great sites and services of the digital age. And as a result, all of this sort of activity, commercial and non-commercial, flourished. So my argument in the book, and what I'm going to put forth today, is that, well, what's good for cyberspace is good for meat space, or the real world. That we need the same general policy approach to other sectors and technologies that we use for the internet whether we're talking about bits, the digital economy, or the economy of atoms, the physical economy, the industrial economy. And that we should start with a policy default, generally speaking, of innovation allowed. Now that seems fairly non-controversial. It's hard to find anybody who says, no, 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 innovation disallowed. I don't like innovation. No, the reality is, is that uh, you know, most people are all in favor of innovation. But there are concerns. There are real risks associated with technological change. There are serious disruptions to our economy, our culture, our social norms, our personal norms, and so on and so forth. This is why some folks still favor what is known as a precautionary principle approach to innovation policy. What's precautionary principle? This is the idea that when crafting public policies around new technologies, that we should control or limit these innovations until the creators can prove that those innovations won't bring about any sort of harm. You might think of it as a sort of, it's better to be safe than sorry sort of mentality as applied to policy or as I'm using a stronger term here, sort of mother may I. Can I do this? Is this okay? You have to ask somebody and then get their permission before you're able to innovate. This is largely what the Europeans have done with a lot of the digital economy. There's a lot of sort of top-down data directives and other sorts of policies governing innovation in the, in the U, EU that we don't see here in the US that I help that I think helps unlock that mystery of those, those charts and tables I showed you earlier. Anyway, what are the rationales for sort of precautionary approaches to regulation? They come down to these five buckets. Safety, broadly considered, that can be both things like child safety or it could be other types of safety like physical safety. Security, cyber security, digital security, data security. Privacy, which we're gonna spend some time talking about. A fourth huge bucket, which could be many sub-buckets, of economic issues associated with automation, job dislocations, disruptions, so on and so forth. And then the fifth, which we've been arguing about for the last 15 years in a very heated way, intellectual property. And that's one where area where the U.S. does do a lot more permissioning because we take stronger views on intellectual property rights. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that here today, but I'd be happy to answer some questions about that approach. Okay, what's the general problem with permissioning? What's wrong with sort of a mother may I approach? Well, I argue in my book that it comes down to this. Generally speaking, if we spend all of our time living in constant fears of worst case scenarios and then basing public policy prescriptions upon those fears, 
then ultimately best case scenarios are not going to come about. That really progress is born from mistakes. It's born from accidents. It's born from learning about the world and the challenges around us and then learning how to adapt to them and prosper in the process. The specific problem was sort of permissioning innovation or having more of a top-down approach. Um, there are numerous problems. It could result in less entrepreneurialism and, uh, and uh, opportunities uh, for, for business, diminished marketplace entry or rivalry among various competitors. Stagnant markets often also means the potential for cronyism, capture. Um, there's the potential loss of comparative advantage or competitive advantage in this when you have policies that restrict your companies relative to other uh, countries or continents. And then for consumers, more importantly, it could mean higher prices or it could just mean fewer choices or less quality choices for them. Okay, so you say fine and well, but hey, really, seriously, what about those risks, right? I mean, privacy is important, safety is important, security, all these things are important. So I spend a lot of time in my work, in my law review articles, in my working papers, and in my new book, talking about sort of better ways to respond to the very serious problems created by t technological disruptions or, and or risks. And I take these arguments very seriously and say we do need to approach these things in a constructive way, but without sort of heavy-handed top-down approaches. What are those other bottom-up, more sort of organic, constructive approaches? Well, education and etiquette efforts. A lot of the problems we face online today, about problems of privacy or safety, have to do with the fact that we don't spend enough time trying to educate people, especially our children, about proper use of technologies, when to use or not to use technologies. That's got to be part of the solution. I spent a lot of time on that in my work. Happy to talk more about it. Empowerment solutions. Technology creates problems, but technology can solve problems. We have a lot of wonderful tools that can help us better protect our privacy in this day and age, but we also have a lot of technologies that violate our visceral sense of privacy. Sometimes we have to find constructive solutions to these problems utilizing new empowerment tools, encryption technologies, ad blocking technologies, a whole host of them. I've got a litany of them cited, not just in my book, but in my law review articles. Happy to talk more about that if you're interested. Social pressure and media pressure. One of the most powerful things to constrain bad behavior, whether it be by firms or individuals, is shining a bright spotlight on it, just bringing attention to bad behavior or things that we find potentially uh, uh, annoying or even harmful. New social norms, I'm going to talk more about this in a, section, a second, as well as resiliency and adaptation. The idea that we learn from doing, learn from interacting, and learn from mistakes. Again, I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Self-regulation and new choices. One of the best ways to better protect safety, security, privacy, in not just the online context, but in these new emerging technologies, is to get companies to compete on those things as well, to get them to highlight how they can better do a better job of dealing with safety, security, privacy concerns than competitors can. And then finally, there are legal mechanisms that I spend a lot of time writing about uh, that people sometimes ignore. We have a, a rich body of common law that deals with all sorts of privacy, safety, and security issues through torts, property rights, laws, laws of contracts, and contractual enforcement. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes we do need targeted legal interventions, and we get them for truly egregious harms that develop because of new technologies. So I've spent a lot of time, as Trevor mentioned in my past, working on online safety task forces and writing books on child safety issues, where I try to defend First Amendment rights of people to communicate freely and express themselves freely. But I'll tell you what, when I had the first of my two children 12 years ago, I finally said, I better put my money where my mouth is and get serious about how to protect kids in the information age because there are legitimate concerns and threats out there. So I talked a lot about how we can use education, empowerment, social norms, public pressure, so on and so forth. But I said at the end of the day, there are going to be some problems where you do need to have targeted and, legal and limited legal interventions. For example, we're having a healthy debate still to this day about cyberbullying. And there are times when bullying can elevate to the point of being very harmful, especially when it involves physical activity but even verbal activity raises the threat of harm. And we're having a, a healthy debate right now about how to have targeted cyberbullying sort of measures to deal with that problem. Even an easier example about a very serious and ugly problem is things having to do with child pornography. That's not something where we're gonna say, well, we just need to educate people. No, 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 we need to go out and find the people who are perpetrating these crimes against children and prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. So we have, obviously, a targeted and legal uh, limited approach to dealing with that problem without saying, well, that's the way you've got to treat all pornography. No, because adult pornography, yeah, it's still touchy, 
There are still laws dealing with things like obscenity. We don't enforce them much. But realistically, we've said, no, this one narrow category is truly harmful. There's no possible benefit to it. We have legal interventions. The same goes for privacy. On privacy, we have targeted legal and limited legal interventions in this country dealing with things like healthcare privacy and financial privacy, where we've said, these are very sensitive forms of personal information. They deserve special sort of treatment. And so we have targeted laws dealing with those. But for a lot of other things, more routine things like, well, what do you like to look at online? Just browse online and will, will we be able to serve you up an ad against that to help pay for this site and service? We generally speaking don't make those things illegal. Um, we say, well, that's something where you're going to have to utilize a combination of these other tools or approaches. Maybe use an ad blocker if you don't like annoying ads. Uh, if you don't like you know, tracking of your uh, activities online for purposes of serving those ads, you use encryption technology, you use a different browser, you use a different search engine. So there are alternatives like that. Now let me talk to you about something that I think is completely overlooked in these debates and is incredibly important, which is societal adaptation, something I mentioned on here. Because in all of these debates about technological change and disruptive technologies, I think it's incredibly important that we give adaptation a chance. I want you to think back about the challenges we faced before and how we've ultimately muddled through a lot of really disruptive forms of technological change. And my favorite example is of the camera and the rise of photography in the late 1800s. Hard for me to imagine anything being more disruptive today than the camera was back in the late 1800s. People used to walk around thinking no one could take my photo and take my image from me and just take it away. It was like your image belonged to you. But then all of a sudden the people could do that with this thing called a camera. So here is a quote from the most famous law review article on privacy ever written in 1890 by Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis before he was a Supreme Court Justice. And it was appropriately entitled, the article in the Harvard Law Review, The Right to Privacy. They said, instantaneous photographs and newspaper enterprise have invaded the sacred precincts of the private and domestic life and numerous mechanical devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. They were terrified about the camera. So much so that they actually discussed, they teased out in their law review article how to put constraints even on the press's ability to take photographs in public. They were also concerned just about average people using them because Warren had a daughter who had gotten married and somebody had the audacity to come stand outside and take a picture when they were walking in public before the wedding. Now today we kind of laugh at this, right? Because the, we got through this. We kind of figured out how to deal with this. We adjusted societal norms and, and our attitudes to accommodate public photography. And instead of rejecting cameras or banning them or regulating them the way that some suggested, we bought a lot of them, right? It became part of the American experience. We learned, though, in the process also how to use them respectfully. We don't, for example, think it's OK for you to take your camera today, even if your camera is, like I'm sure all of you, like mine, on your phone. I don't know about you, but when I go into my gym, you know, it's not respectful to go around like this, you know, right? Somebody's going to say something. My gym that I work at has a big sign that says no cell phones in the locker room. So that's a different kind of social norm imposed by a private entity. We also have rules about when it's appropriate to use phones and cameras in other contexts. Think about how you're bombarded with notices before you sit down at a movie these days about just turning off or muting your cell phone, right? And of course they do that partially also because they don't want people using phones to film anything for IP purposes, but it's also just for the aesthetic of the, uh, of the environment, making sure people aren't talking on their phones or using them. So we, we sometimes find a way, I use this term muddle through, we find a way to muddle through disruptive technological changes. This is not to say it's easy. It's not to say we should take it lightly. There are serious problems that have arisen in our societies because of cameras. If you think about the problems associated with paparazzi. When I was in journalism school in the mid 80s, I remember taking an ethics class. It was, it was predominantly focused on what to do about all these situations about how people utilize cameras. And it was mostly the press at the time, but today it's just average Joes and Janes and how we use cameras in other contexts. There are hard, legitimate problems. We've developed targeted means of getting at them. Peeping Tom laws and other ways to stop people from utilizing them, or at least discouraging them from utilizing them. Okay, so let me try to put this all together in one chart. This is uh, an image I've used in a couple of review articles and in my book, where I say, like, think of this as a spectrum. This idea of permissionless innovation versus precautionary principle. And the reality is, I want to be clear, we're almost never here at pure permissionless innovation, and we're very rarely there at pure precautionary principle. We're very rarely out to completely ban a technology or censor things. And we don't always just say, oh, just get over it, right? That's kind of 
rude to just say you just got to adapt to every new technology. The reality is we find sort of middle solutions. But I always like to say, let's at least try to think about starting here with these bottom-up solutions. How can we use social pressures and norms, learn how to cope, continue to experiment with new things, see how society adapts, and then find ways to use these other strategies. Again, education and media literacy, labeling, transparency, user empowerment, self-regulation, before then getting into the question of more slightly permissioned approaches, transparency mandates perhaps, or industry best practice guidance, privacy and security by design policies, uh, potentially restrictive defaults, government tweaking defaults or encouraging companies to change them for privacy, safety, or security purposes. And then, of course, the last resort, which you always be very careful about because of all the costs that I highlighted, of going to the sort of outright prohibition on technologies or technological practices. So that's how I hope we can start to think about some of these emerging technology issues that I want to talk to you about next. So there's so many cool things coming online right now. Um, so many cool gizmos and gadgets. Many of them are essentially coming out of the information age revolution as the internet essentially gets baked into all of our goods and gadgets. So you see the rise of the internet of things when the internet is literally sewn into our own clothes and all of our appliances and wearable technologies, smart homes, smart cities, smart cars. It's, this is why there's an intersection with robotics. You have autonomous vehicles, smart car technology. The subject of my next paper is a big paper on intelligent vehicle technologies and the challenges it creates for society. Private drones, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and artificial intelligence as well. There's a huge emerging, really interesting intersection between modern information technology and health issues and medical devices. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of these in a moment, including my next, uh, one of my next papers on biohacking. But mobile medical apps, genetic testing issues, some of this innovation and that innovation driven by 3D printing and additive manufacturing. These issues are going to create huge tensions, again, because they're going to raise more of the old tensions. Privacy, safety, security, economic issues, and IP. Everything that we've faced before, we're going to face by a multiple of 10 in the future. So everything that you've dealt with for your bosses or your committees is going to come before you again and again and again as all of the tensions of the information age move into the industrial world. Here's a very crude first effort by me, I'm sorry about the small print, to basically stack all those issues on one side and then take the policy concerns and sort of assign some sort of severity ranking. This is completely subjective, n zero science to this whatsoever. Um, basically, I say like for things like data collection driven concerns of the Internet of Things and wearable technology, privacy is going to be the biggest issue there, followed probably by safety and security. Whereas in robotics, the primary concern is more safety driven with the potential for economic disruption being a huge concern because of job dislocations and automation and what that means for business. Um, you look at medical, clearly medical is much more driven by safety considerations, what it means for your health first and foremost, but then a huge issue about intellectual property uh, arises in the field of medicine because of the way it will be so easy to replicate drugs and devices going forward, especially with 3D printing, which is why there's a lot of overlap between these two. Again, totally subjective, just a way to think about the issues that are coming up. So let me talk just about a couple of case studies and then I'll take your questions. Um, the first case study, this is my, uh, my next paper after I do my paper on autonomous vehicle technology. I'm doing a paper on the Internet of Things and wearables. Uh, again, the promise here, I'm going to talk about the promise and the fear of each of these technologies or issues. The promise is we're going to live in a world where we have always on devices that are sensing our activities. They can track their activities and then customize our experiences to our needs and desires. So every device in your life, everything you're wearing, everything in your home, everything in your office, fully networked, communicating in real time, and helping you make your life easier in some way, shape, or form. Now the fears here are pretty straightforward. I mean, first and foremost is privacy. You know, there's going to be a boatload of data about every one of us being collected by all of the devices in our lives. Sometimes we won't even be aware of it. We'll turn it on when we get our smart toaster, smart refrigerator, or smart watch, smart whatever. And we'll set it and forget it. And I'll just start vacuuming up data about us. Where is that shared? Where is it all going? Security. What if all that stuff gets hacked? I mean, if all of our networks, if all of our devices are networks together, can someone remotely hack away at our refrigerator or whatever our appliance or our cars? Security issue. There's even a concern about discrimination. How the information that is collected by all these devices is then used 
to advantage or disadvantage users. Right now in the autonomous vehicles world, in the smart vehicles world, uh, there are insurance companies that will offer you for an incentive uh, the ability to track your driving behavior and then you get a driver's discount if you are always under the speed limit or you're not traveling too far or you don't travel during certain hours of the evening. Like really late at night, bad time to drive it turns out. Uh, bad things happen at after dark, especially in the wee hours of the morning. If you don't drive then, you get a discount. If you only drive so many miles a day, turns out people who drive less, who knew? Have fewer accidents, right? Shocking. And then of course speed limit issues could be playing into that. Is that okay? Is that discrimination? Or is, that, is that good discrimination though? Because a lot of people are saving huge money now. People are getting, you know, uh, $30, $40 discounts off bills. It's huge. What if we all had to do it? I think some of us have a huge problem with that. Those of us who love cars and buy too many of them, uh, <laughs> uh, like me, would be really concerned if that was a mandate, right? Something to think about, though. So that's the world of Internet of Things and wearables. And the opportunities here are enormous. This is just a snapshot from last year, it was two years ago, of the Internet of Things landscape. I don't even, I've never even heard of most of the companies on this. But this, these are almost all American companies. And the amount of innovation taking place in this space was witnessed this year at the Consumer Electronics Show in January, which was sort of the coming out party for Internet of Things and wearable technologies. They were everywhere. Every other booth had somebody putting together some sort of technology that had a sensor, some sort of a microchip, and in some cases a camera on it. This is the future. It's going to create huge issues. So what do we do? How do we, how do we address these issues? Because uh, they're not going to go away. Well, one answer is we've got to get a lot more serious about what's called privacy by design or security by design efforts. We have to make sure that companies bake in good best practices, good things into their technologies to make users aware of the information being collected and how to potentially limit it or maybe turn it off if they don't want to use it at all. Education and tech etiquette is going to be huge here. We need to talk to each other, especially our kids, about when technologies like this should be utilized. One of the most popular wearable technologies right now is Google Glass. I'm sure many of you have seen it, but you maybe even played with it. The more interesting one that a colleague of mine in the office has is called Narrative Clip. It's a little one inch by one inch camera that clips, affixes to your lapel, or you can wear it as a necklace. It takes, once you automate it to do so, 30, a snapshot of everything you're doing in your life every 30 seconds. At the end of the day, it uploads that entire life log onto the cloud, and you can go back and look what you were doing. It's your daily life. It's your daily life log. Eventually, that'll be video. You can imagine the kind of societal issues this creates. I have a 12-year-old daughter. She's starting to think about boys. I'm starting to be pretty paranoid about it. And I'm thinking, what are boys going to do filming with dates and my daughter? And then I said, wait a minute. No, my daughter might be using hers, and I'll see that boy, and I can go after him, right? And it's like <laughs> spy versus spy kind of thing. So there can be good and you know, upsides and downsides to these technologies. But we have to talk to kids about when it's even appropriate to be wearing a technology like that. And we need to talk to each other about it. This is already happening in bars and restaurants where people are being told in San Francisco, this is a no glass zone. Do not wear Google Glass in this establishment because there's, there's physical altercations developing from people utilizing technologies like this. But eventually, you can, you can only do that right now because you can see people working in gla Google Glass. In another two to three years, it's going to be, again, it's going to be the button on my shirt. You wouldn't even notice that right now I'm filming all of you. I'm not. But what do we do? Well, how do we talk to kids and people about that? Like, tell me, are you filming right now? Because when my colleague at the office who has narrative clip goes to meetings, he sits down and he says, oh, by the way, I've been filming all this for the last 45 minutes. People are like, what the hell? You know, you can't do that. We're talking about sets of stuff here. You're going to have to have policies in the workplace for how to deal with technologies like these. Some of it may be a legal issue, contractually enforced, but a lot of it's going to have to be norm-driven. Social pressure, social sanctions. Again, I give the examples of theaters and locker rooms, how we already are doing this with existing cell phones. We're going to have to find common law adjudication mechanisms. Some of these things will go to court. We're going to fight about them. Again, is it a contractual issue? Are there privacy torts that can handle this? Um, there are certain laws on the books, but there are also certain common law norms that we might be able to use. This is going to be the, one of the more interesting areas to watch. It's already being heavily, uh, a lot of heavy activity. The Federal Trade Commission, through its Section 5 Unfair and Deceptive Practice Authority, already goes after companies that have truly egregious privacy and data security practices. So if you are developing a technology that is, for example, filming people doing things when it's not supposed to be filming at all, which is a recent case, 
Well, that's an unfair and deceptive practice in the eyes of the FTC, and you can be slapped with a fine and a 20-year privacy audit, among other things. This is a huge area of enforcement activity. In conjunction with state AGs, to, uh, attorneys general, um, we're going to see a lot more going on that front with regards to the Internet of Things. But it's going to be very, very hard to figure out how to do this in a traditional privacy sense where we said, well, we want to give consumers notice and, cons and choice to give them the ability to consent to everything. In a world of always-on technologies like the Internet of Things and wearables, how do you do notice and choice? If I was wearing Google Glass right now or had a narrative clip, would I be walking down the road or through the room saying, do you consent, do you consent, do you consent, do you consent? I just I can't do that. So what's going to happen is instead we're going to have targeted data use restrictions. We're going to have probably the evolution of privacy by design and security by design policies as well as some potential government-focused policies that say, no, you can't do really egregiously stupid things with the data you're collecting. We know you're going to vacuum it all up. We don't like that, but it's a reality. And so what law is going to eventually come to do is realize we have to have a narrow class of, of things where you say, you can't do this. You can't film, for example, somebody in a state of undress in a public restroom and then upload that to the Internet. People already, of course, try to do this, in some cases do, but that's a kind of use restriction you could say, we know you'll be filming and you might even walk into a bathroom, incidentally, but you should either cover that up, or you should hide it, you should turn it off, whatever. Um, and then finally, back to my own point, you know, at the end of the day, law and all the rest can only do so much. There's going to have to be a certain amount of social, ad social ad adaptation. I mean, when I first told my daughter about narrative clip, her first reaction was not the revulsion that many of us have. It was like, cool, when can I get one? Right? A lot of kids already adapted to the idea that they live in this world. Their phones are always on, always with them. You know, it is the equivalent of a piece of wearable technology for them. Okay, so that's that. Uh, the second issue I won't spend as much time on is intelligent vehicles. This is pretty straightforward. The promise here is really obviously quite clear. We're talking about 33,000 people who die in automobile-related uh, accidents every year. It's an astonishing number. Luckily, it's been going down now for over a decade. Um, but autonomous vehicle technology, smart car technology just refers to like intelligent gadgetry in your car, but you're still driving. Autonomous vehicle means you're no longer driving that car. You may have seen the new Google car, it doesn't even have a steering wheel. We're talking about a huge reduction in potential fatalities, huge reductions in traffic, obvious environmental benefits. The fear? Well, do robot cars make smart decisions? This is a really wonderful ethical debate going on right now about what's so-called the, the trolley problem in the world of philosophy. The trolley problem refers to like these scenarios about like if you have a trolley and it's going down a track and it can either go straight and hit another trolley, or it can go to the right and hit somebody, or to the left and go off the bridge and kill you. What do you do? You know, it's like, there's no good answer to these things. But what if a robot's making that decision? How do you program, program it so that the algorithm makes the decision that maximizes life? Even at maybe the expense of your own. Hard question. Not sure it's a legal one. Could be, though. Who's liable when accidents happen? That's definitely a legal issue. And this is a huge issue in, in not just the United States, but every country because of the world of insurance and liability for automobiles is a massive marketplace. Luckily, autonomous vehicles should result in a massive reduction in premiums and insurance concerns because they'll just be so much safer than we humans at driving these big two-ton, three-ton machines. But still, the liability issues are interesting. We'll see how they evolve. Are driverless cars hackable? Can people put together a program, and certainly some jerk will, that tries to take over your car and drive it somewhere off the road? You know, this is, this is a problem, but we shouldn't make too much in it. Remember, go back to my main point. Don't let hypothetical worst case scenarios discourage you from all the best case scenarios that could develop. This is a worst case scenario. Somebody hacking your car to drive it off a bridge. Couldn't be any worse than that. But unlikely scenario, and one we can probably find ways to deal with using other technologies and some law. And then, of course, privacy. You know, what about all the data collected in your car? I already gave you the example of the insurance company who collects that information voluntarily but there's going to be a question going forward about how much more of it is going to be sucked up and what could it be utilized for. Will your divorce attorney be able to subpoena your records of where your car was when your ex-spouse says, I think he was cheating on me. I'd like to know everywhere he drove over the last two years. Theoretically possible now. Uh, addressing these, I won't go through the list again. It mostly involves a combination of privacy and security best practices. Industry is already doing that, developing an excellent list of privacy and security best practices, trying to get out ahead of these problems before they develop. Um, insurance and liability norms are going to evolve. There's been wonderful reports done by Lloyds of London, among others, talking about how insurance markets actually could solve a lot of these liability concerns so that we don't have to have uh, sort of a preemptive response. Possible policy tweaks coming. We're going to have to deal with how we license drivers. 
especially when you're not a driver anymore at all, what are you doing in a car? What do you need to know about the operation of that car when a machine's doing most of the work for you? I already mentioned liability. And then there's, again, a possibility of a, a narrowly drawn use restriction for privacy purposes about where, how much your personal information can be used for. Final issue, uh, commercial drones. Uh, this is a fun one for me. I spend a lot of time on it these days. It's currently illegal to operate a drone uh, for commercial purposes in the United States, but if you're a hobbyist, you can operate it. Um, there are so many potential interesting uses for private unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, I mentioned a few here, agriculture, environmental mon monitoring, hazardous work that humans can't or shouldn't be doing, shipping freight issues, journalism and entertainment. This is a, a really hot, sticky issue because of First Amendment related issues. Um, I mean, bottom line is you could be talking about a much safer mode of delivering things or doing things than cars, machines, or just our bodies. And that's the promise of drones. The fear, obviously safety. What if they fall from the sky or run into it, the, you know, the blades whirl around in our head. Uh, bad. <laughs> Privacy. But monitor every move, right? That's the concern that people have. Well, not really. I mean, the reality is, is it's hard for a drone to be always monitoring everybody's moves or even a, a fleet of them. But Theoretically, yeah, they could be used to surveil. They could be used to track people's activities the same way some existing technologies could. Again, we'll have targeted standards, and we already have privacy torts that probably deal with things if it's like a stalking activity. It's probably going to be pretty hard to stalk somebody with a drone. It's more likely you'd do it with like a wearable tech item. But that privacy consideration is nonetheless, nonetheless omnipresent. So I'm not going to go through again the the ways to address it, it's basically the same. What about big issues to watch? These are three of my favorite. Um, I should have put robotics on this list as well. But uh, the 3D printing wars are sort of already underway. It's interesting, uh, they started with guns. People 3D printing their own uh, uh, weapons. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, my argument there would be, well, you already have gun laws. It shouldn't be any different for a gun that you print with a 3D printer versus a gun that's manufactured by Remington, Smith & Wesson. So I think existing gun laws will be with that, but there's so many other things that can be 3D printed. In the world of health, there are people now who are 3D printing prosthetics for poor kids in Africa, and the old prosthetics used to cost somewhere between forty dollars to $45,000. People are now printing 3D prosthetic hands and arms for $40. I mean, think about the cost reduction on that amazing success stories of you know, how we're utilizing these things, but what happens when you're doing 3D printing of all sorts of other stuff on your body, or we get into the world of biohacking, which is the topic of uh, my third upcoming paper, the world of embeddables, ingestibles, and biohacking. People are saying, well, anything that I could 3D print or manufacture myself, in theory, I can start doing these things to my body myself. I can hack away at my own body. Some people are already doing this. They're called grinders. And in the world of the grinding community, the biohacking community, you can go to a site like biohackme.com where you can find forums about people who will tell you how to put magnets in your fingers. You know, you know why do I want a magnet in my finger? I'm going to paper clips all the time. I wouldn't be able to go through an airport detector and can't do an MRI anymore. But hey, you can do cool things if you've got magnets in your fingers. You can actually detect electromagnetic signals or, or, or fields, rather. Um, you can utilize them for some types of tasks that may require magnets. I don't know, maybe you just think it's cool for party tricks, right? Eh, let me at least slide and stuff under a table. Whatever, people do that. People are putting stuff in their skulls now, making so that you can have bone conduction. You can have your phones ring into your skull. You won't hear anything, your little thing in your bone, in your head starts buzzing. Now, some of us may find this creepy. Um, there may be a very legitimate safety issue here. But there's a question. Do people have the right to modify their own bodies in this fashion? This is going to be the, one of the most interesting debates to follow over the next five to ten years. I've argued that it's going to follow something like what we had to fight over reproductive rights in this country. Like, what do you have the right to do with your own body, even if it potentially comes at a harm to you? Interesting thing to watch. A lot of hard uh, questions. To, ge genetic diagnostics, this is something you may have already uh, been following. I don't know if, how many of you followed the 23andMe fight. Uh, you know, spit in a tube, send it off to a lab. They send you back a genetic report saying you're predisposed to this and that. They thought, well, what's the harm? We're just giving consumers more information about their lives, about their health, about their genetic predispositions to certain uh, issues or diseases. Uh, the FDA cracked down on them. Uh, said, no, you can't do this. People could utilize this, to, use this information to make really bad decisions. Um, so now there's a huge legal battle going on about this. Well, in the future, it's going to be easier and easier. I mean. My Samsung phone, 
heart rate monitor. And it, it can also, when I run it, it's got a, I forget the name of it, uh, not an accelerometer, but a pedometer, whatever the thing that measures your walking your steps. I used to have a Fitbit for this, but now my phone could do it as I walk. There is something like 10 health-related apps that come embedded in this just from Samsung alone. And again, the health monitor, or the heart rate monitor is on here as well. Is this a medical device? Should the FDA regulate that? I don't know. Right now, it doesn't tell me what to do. It doesn't say, you're about to have a heart attack and die, dude. No, it just says, this is the information. Now, I can share that information with others. When I share it with my doctor, now is it a medical device? Still unclear. Hard questions coming, and there's going to be a lot more devices like that going forward. Um, so let me just wrap up with just a few general thoughts. This is sort of the, the very generic approach I have in the book and in my work about how to think about promoting innovation. Um, forbearance is an important privacy uh, policy value. First, do no harm. Don't jump to regulate new technology based on worst case scenarios. You heard me just go through a half dozen or maybe more, like, oh, this could happen, that could happen. Ultimately, that kind of stuff all drives a lot of policy debates, especially because the press seizes on it and makes that worst case scenario sort of a mountain out of a molehill. But we shouldn't make that the basis for policy. We should forbear until we know there's actual demonstrable harms. That means we need to be patient and also wait and see how individuals and institutions and organizations adapt to these new technologies or what solutions they come up with. Also, policymakers need to have some sense of humility, understand the limit of their own knowledge or even the knowledge of so-called experts to predict the future and the problems that might develop. Obviously, restraint, limit, and target your interventions if they're needed at all after exhausting all of those other options. But restrain from doing so until we absolutely have no choice. And then finally, always constantly be reevaluating policies we put in place in these fields. Because the reality is, is these, these technologies move so very quickly. Um, we always need to be conducting strict cost-benefit analysis to figure out, do the proposals make sense? Do the old rules still make sense? When the world moves at the pace of Moore's Law, Moore's Law, as most of you know, is the, the old standard rule of thumb that the uh, power of a microchip doubles every, about every you know, two years and its price falls in half. That has been in place now for like 40 years, no changes, still exponential change. And this means that the fundamental law of the information age, as technology author uh, Larry Downs points out, is the idea of the law of disruption, the idea that technology evolves exponentially while policy evolves incrementally. And that mismatch is what's ultimately driving all of the tensions we've talked about here today. And it's why we always have to be reevaluating our policies we put in place to deal with technological issues to make sure that they make sense. So that does it. Uh, I've got some other recommended readings in the packet. And you've also got my, uh, my booklet. Happy to answer any questions you may have about any of these matters or anything else. And again, please read the book. Thank you very much. Any questions?